Hi everybody, thanks for joining me again as I continue my look at C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, examining it from my atheistic perspective. Uh, this video I'm going to look at book two, which is subtitled What Christians Believe. But before I begin looking at book two, I want to go back very briefly to the previous video, looking at book one, and just go back to some of the points I made, because a few people left comments that have uh, encouraged me to revise and expand my remarks. First, in, in the previous video, I argued that uh, to me, it doesn't make sense to believe in morality as something that exists independently from humanity because as far as we know, humanity is the only example of a moral being. Now, several people actually commented to remind me of what I already knew, that there are studies that suggest that there are animal societies that demonstrate moral behavior or what uh, I heard... I think Michael Shermer calls it a pre-moral behavior. Uh, ape societies, chimpanzees specifically, seem to uh, demonstrate some form of moral code among their societies and their communities. So humanity may not be the only moral being on this planet, and therefore in existence. But uh, the existence of other moral beings besides us, strengthens my objection to Lewis's assertion that outside observers wouldn't be able to discern our morality without knowing our language or our history just by watching our behavior, because according to him, morality does not dictate behavior, it just dictates the kind of behavior we ought to engage in. But to a large degree, morality does dictate behavior, and it's because morality does dictate behavior that we have been able to detect it in these chimpanzee societies and among other animals uh, because it does actually it doesn't necessarily dictate behavior but it strongly influences it that is the function of morality that's why we still have it because it works because it does influence our behavior and it does cause us to behave in ways that are beneficial both to ourselves and and to the larger society that we are a member of and then also I said in the previous video that in order for math to exist you need people to do math and someone left a comment pointing out that it would be better to say that the language of math would not exist without people here to express that language, but that mathematical concepts would still exist independent of humanity. Mathematical concepts are not dependent on our existence. Uh, they would still be here. They would still be real. These concepts and the rules that govern how they relate to each other would still be there. It's just that nobody would be there to perceive and comprehend and understand and employ them. Uh, so I, I, I agree with that and I stand corrected on that as well. So now that I've got that out of the way, let's move on to book two, which as I said is titled What Christians Believe. And chapter one of book two is called uh, The Rival Conceptions of God. Lewis begins that chapter by asserting that a Christian need not believe that other religions have all got it completely wrong, merely that when Christianity and another religion disagree, Christianity is right and the other religion is wrong. But you don't need to throw out other religions completely. And uh, Lewis also refers, not for the first time, but for the first time that I'm going to remark upon, uh, refers to his own atheism. He claims that before he was a Christian, he was an atheist. And he says, quote, When I was an atheist, I had to try to persuade myself that most of the human race have always been wrong about the question that mattered to them the most. When I became a Christian, I was able to take a more liberal view. Now, when Lewis says that you don't have to throw out all other religions completely if you are a Christian, uh, what he means is, uh, well, he demonstrates what he means by dividing people through a series of divisions according to their beliefs starting with everybody and then whittling it down finally to Christians, and here's how he does that. The first division that he makes is the obvious one between those who believe that gods exist and those who don't, so between religious people and atheists. And that includes Christians, Jews, Muslims, the ancient Greeks and Romans, the ancient Egyptians, Hindus, it's everybody who has ever believed that there are gods. Those people are separated from atheists who don't believe in gods. Then the next division among those people who do believe in gods uh, is between what Lewis describes as pantheism, or the belief that God sort of is ever-present everywhere, and he is, you know, every little bit of matter in the universe is part of God, um, and the moral God of Christians and Jews and Muslims. 
uh, the God who defines that there is a right and a wrong. The pantheistic God that Lewis describes is sort of beyond morality. He doesn't really make any moral judgments about anyone or anything, whereas the Christian Judeo-Muslim God is very much a moral God who has moral expectations for how we ought to behave. And also, related to this division, Lewis also says that in addition to being moral, this God, the Christian, the Judeo-Christo-Islamic God, we might call it, um, is different from that pantheistic God because Christians believe that God invented the universe, not that God himself is the same thing as the universe, whereas the pantheistic viewpoint is that God is the universe, that God is suffused throughout every speck of existence. That's, it's all part of God. Uh, Christians believe that it's the product of God, it's the product of his imagination, of his will. Uh, and I've had conversations with many Christians who say that God's will is what sustains the universe, but they still draw a distinction between the person of God and the existence of the universe. So that's the next division that Lewis makes. So as to the question of why this world made by a good God has gone so wrong, Lewis says, quote, And for many years I simply refused to listen to the Christian answers to this question because I kept on feeling, whatever you say and however clever your arguments are, isn't it a much simpler and easier thing to say that the world was not made by any intelligent power? Aren't all your arguments simply a complicated attempt to avoid the obvious? My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got the idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? Let's talk a little bit about what Lewis is saying here. Uh, let me start right there with that quote at the end, since it ties in very nicely actually with the beginning of the chapter. Um, we can see through this chapter why Lewis values the moral argument so highly, and why he spent the first book of Mere Christianity unspooling this protracted formulation of the moral argument. Um, it's very important to him. In fact, it seems like uh, it was the very thing that turned him into a Christian from an atheist, as he says, in the first place. So let's start with that, and then I'll go back and discuss Lewis's atheism more generally. Uh, Lewis said that he used to feel that uh, Christians, when they were arguing for their God, were straining to avoid the obvious because it's just easier to argue that the world is naturalistic, that there was no intelligent power involved. And I think that's certainly true. It is much easier just to say that, just to believe, you know what, the universe is just natural, there is no intelligent power, there is no designer, there is no God. Done. Nice and clean. Absolutely true. I completely believe that. I completely accept that. But the problem is, it's not a very good reason to be an atheist. Um, and neither is Lewis's objection to the cruelty and the unjustness, the injustice, I should say, since I'm an English major, um, of the universe. If, if Lewis's only real argument against God was that he thought the universe was cruel and unjust, that's not a very good argument. That's not a very good reason to be an atheist. Nor is this simplicity argument. Um, and, and in fact, an atheist who says that he doesn't believe in God or gods because it's just easier that way, deserves no more respect for his belief than a Christian who says that he believes in the resurrection because he wants to see his dead wife again someday. The atheist might be right, I might agree with the atheist that there are no gods, but he, like the Christian who is just wanting to see his wife again, they're both basing their beliefs about reality on what is preferable to them, not on what they have reason to believe is actually true. And that's the key. You must have a reason, a real compelling reason, to believe that something, anything, a given something, is true. Without at least one such reason, and preferably many such real compelling reasons, I submit not only that you shouldn't believe in this given something, but that you can't believe in it. You have to have at least one reason to believe that something is true. Belief is not nearly as voluntary as we often make it sound. Uh, it's, there is an involuntary aspect to belief that is very important. Most of the things that we believe, we don't believe out of choice, but because we have been convinced that these things are true, that we ought to believe them, that these things are worth believing because they're probably true. Um, for instance, 
I don't believe that the Earth goes around the sun because I think it's a nice story or because I think that it's easier to believe than the geocentric model. Um, I believe it because I have good reasons to think that it's true. I believe it because I've been convinced that that belief represents reality. So whether an atheist finds belief in no gods to be easier and simpler or not, should be irrelevant to his holding of that belief. I'm an atheist, and most atheists I know are atheists because it's the most sensible position given what we know about the universe. Not because it's less complicated, not because it's less philosophically messy, but because we think that it's true. How we feel about it, the advantages and disadvantages that we find along with it, these are all completely separate issues to the fact that we believe and the reasons that we believe it. Lewis also talks about how he got hung up on the fact that the universe was cruel and unjust and how he knew that such things as cruelty and injustice existed in the first place. What, he, what was he comparing the universe to to decide that it was cruel and unjust? Um, we discussed morality at length in the last video, uh, so I'll just add here briefly that an atheistic universe, as I see it, is neither just nor unjust. It simply is. It's morally neutral. The universe isn't cruel, and I wouldn't even say, I'm not even comfortable saying that the universe is indifferent to our suffering and our plight. Uh, it's simply unaware. It just doesn't know. It, 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 as far as we can tell, the universe is not a conscious thinking organism. The universe is not a single mind. It doesn't really know anything in the sense that, that we think of knowing things. So therefore, the universe is not a moral being. Therefore, our concepts of morality of cruelty and justice and so forth don't apply to it at all. So it's really not a proper thing for an atheist to call the universe a cruel or unjust place. It just it, the, the, Those are not the right terms to use. Now let's move on to Lewis's atheism. He opens this chapter by saying that an atheist is burdened by having to believe that most of humanity has always been wrong about the existence of gods. Now, um, as an atheist, this is what I believe, uh, and I actually don't find this belief to be a burden at all. In fact, I find it to be a pretty obvious conclusion. Um, I have a friend, a Facebook friend named Kim, hi Kim, uh, who has said this to me before, that it's just difficult for her to fathom believing that Almost everybody in the entire history of the human race has gotten this so wrong. How could we have all gotten this so wrong for so long? But I question why it's so difficult for people to believe. I mean, humanity throughout our history, we have been wrong about most things most of the time. This is just part of, and it's nothing to do, nothing to blame us for. I, I, I'm not saying that it's, it's to our detriment. I'm a huge fan of our species, but it's just the nature of our lives, it's the nature of our existences. We are usually wrong before we get it right. Even the things that we're right about now, so far as we know, we used to be wrong about very, very rarely in our history and throughout all of our cultures and all of our civilizations, all of our various pursuits of science and knowledge, very, very rarely have we ever stumbled upon the right answer right out of the gate. It takes us a while. We have to fuck up a little before we finally figure it out and get the right answer. And you know what? The things that we think today of as the right answers might turn out to be wrong. People in a thousand years, if there are still people in a thousand years, might look back at us and find some of our beliefs kind of quaint and simplistic and childish. Uh, you never know. It's just the nature of existence. It's the nature of life. We're wrong most of the time about most things. So it's not a stretch at all for me to believe that we have been wrong all this time, those of us who have believed in the existence of gods and the supernatural, uh, that all of those people are wrong. It's very, very easy for me to believe that all of those people are wrong, especially since all of the, most of the things we've been wrong about, these, these scientific things, there's at least evidence for these things. There's at least phenomena that can be studied and cataloged and measured and predicted and analyzed when you're talking about the supernatural, when you're talking about the existence of God, you're talking about something that there is no evidence for at all. So if we can get all the stuff that has evidence so wrong, so long, most of the time, why is it such a reach to say that we also get this other stuff for which there's no evidence at all? Wrong. It just, it just, it just, it's a very nonsensical argument to me. Even if you're not an atheist, let's say you're a Christian, 
Uh, as a Christian, and Lewis's attempts at uh, pluralism aside at the beginning of the chapter, uh, you don't believe in other people's gods. You believe in your God. You believe that your God is the only true God, and anyone who believes in another God is wrong. So, as Richard Dawkins has often said, Christians, or religious people in general, are atheists. They're atheists for all the other gods except for theirs. So they believe that all the people like atheists who have believed in no gods and all the people who believe in gods other than the god they believe in have all been wrong. That's a pretty big chunk of humanity. That's pretty much almost everybody all throughout history have been wrong. So it's not just that it's an obvious and easy to stomach belief. It's something that pretty much everybody already believes, whether they realize it or not. No matter which way you slice it, whether you believe in atheism or whether you believe in a particular religious faith, almost all of humanity has almost always gotten it completely wrong. So it's, that is not a very good objection. Now, Lewis says that he used to be an atheist, but then he hit a wall when he came up against the moral argument. He couldn't explain where his morals had come from if there was not a god. Um, Lee Strobel, the author of The Case for Christ, also claims that he was an atheist before he became a Christian. And I don't actually believe Strobel when he says that. Um, I don't think that he was ever actually an atheist because the way he talks about his atheism suggests that he was never actually an atheist. He talks about atheism the same way that Christians always talk about atheism. He doesn't talk about atheism as though he ever truly accepted it and understood it. And that makes me suspicious. Um, and uh, I actually think something similar about most modern Christian apologists who claim that they were atheists before they were born again. I think that uh, few, if any of them, were actually ever real, avowed, confident atheists. I think what's more likely is that they read C.S. Lewis and realized that the ability to utter the sentence, you know, back when I was an atheist, was a tool that they wanted in their kit when they were giving sermons to people. Um, but Lewis himself, even though he's been a great influence on people like Lee Strobel and William Lane Craig, Josh McDowell, etc., etc., um, Lewis himself is not nearly as dishonest or condescending as those modern-day would-be successors of his are. Uh, so, fuck it. I'll take his word for it. He used to be an atheist, and then he was persuaded to become a Christian, beginning with the moral argument. I'll, you know what? It happens. So I'll take his word for it. I'll take that at face value. He's earned that much respect for me. Um, and then before we move on to the next chapter, one more thing, very quickly, about the divisions that he performs to whittle humanity down from everybody to Christians. Um, notice how the divisions he chooses to make are ones that support his argument. Um, he divides people up in such a way so as to allow him to frame everything according to the moral argument, ending with separating those who believe in a moral God from those who believe in a God who exists beyond morality. He doesn't divide, for instance, deists from theists. Uh, he doesn't divide monotheists from polytheists. He mentions polytheistic and monotheistic traditions, but he never bothers to make that separation because that doesn't support his thesis of the moral argument. He writes these things as though this is simply the way things shake out, that you go from atheism and theism down through pantheism and Christianity, but he, he writes as though this is just the, the way things happen to be laying on the table. But he is very deliberately shaping this presentation to fit his argument. The reason why I can respect the way he does it, and I can't respect the way Lee Strobel does it, is because Lewis is actually a skilled writer He's a skilled rhetorician. He knows what he's doing. He seems like an intelligent person who I happen to disagree with, as opposed to Lee Strobel, who I always felt that I was like uh, a horse and he was grabbing my bridle and trying to drag me someplace I didn't want to go. Uh, Lewis is more like uh, the horse whisperer. On to chapter two, which is called The Invasion. At the beginning of this chapter, Lewis disparages what he calls Christianity and water. And what he means by that is the belief that embraces all the good, positive aspects of Christianity, like a good God and a, a paradise-like heaven for an afterlife, but leaves out stuff about sin and hell and the devil. Uh, he says that asking for a simple religion without all the complicated bits is just silly because life itself is complicated and odd. 
And for one example, he says, quote, For instance, when you have grasped that the Earth and the other planets all go round the Sun, you would naturally expect that all the planets were made to match, all at equal distances from each other, say, or distances that regularly increased, or all the same size, or else getting bigger or smaller as you go further from the Sun. In fact, you find no rhyme or reason that we can see about either the sizes or the distances, and some of them have one moon, one has four, one has two, some have none, and one has a ring. Reality, in other words, is stranger than we expected, and Lewis says the same thing about Christianity, that it is a religion that nobody would have expected, that nobody would have just made up. And in fact, he says that's one of the reasons why he believes it, because it runs so contrary to our expectations. Lewis says that only two views can explain the universe as we find it, the Christian view and the dualist view. Now, um, the Christian view is that it's a good world gone wrong, and the dualist view, which Lewis describes, is uh, the view that there are two equally powerful forces in the universe, one good and one bad, and that they are battling it out with the universe as their battlefield. And Lewis calls dualism, uh, quote, the manliest and most sensible creed other than Christianity. He, he has a lot of respect for dualism. But Lewis himself is not a dualist, and in order to demonstrate the fallacy of dualism, he dives right back into the moral argument. Because he says, he explains, if we believe that one of the gods is truly good, and the other god is truly evil, we must therefore be appealing to a standard that is higher than either of them in order to determine which one is really good and which one is really bad. We're not just picking sides with the god we happen to agree with or happen to like the best. We're saying one is really good and one is really bad, and there must be the higher standard uh, that he talked about when he was making his moral argument in book one. Uh, then Lewis goes on at length for most of the chapter to argue that there couldn't be any such thing as a truly bad god anyway, because it, while it is possible to be good for goodness sake, to do good things just because you like to be good, it's not possible to be bad for badness sake. Uh, people are bad, Lewis argues, due to sadism, which he considers a perversion of something good, uh, or because they are chasing some goal. In other words, to Lewis, uh, bad is simply good gone wrong. You can't have bad defined in and of itself. Bad has to be dependent upon good. It's the perversion or the twisting of good that makes something bad. And he says the Christian model, which tells us that Satan, the devil, is a fallen angel portraying evil as a rebellion against the ultimate good, makes more sense in light of this. And he actually says that Christianity is much more dualistic than a lot of Christians realize because of this, but it is not uh, perfectly dualist because uh, even though it does portray a good power and a bad power, the bad power is definitely below and dependent upon the good power. And then Lewis closes the chapter by describing Christianity through a war metaphor. He describes the world as enemy-occupied territory, and he says that going to church is like listening into the secret wireless radio messages being sent into enemy-occupied territory by the good guys, uh, which he describes as the army of the true king who is someday going to land and return to reclaim this world that is rightfully his. Um, and then he finishes off by affirming that yes, he does believe in a literal devil, although perhaps not one with hoofs and horns. He says his, his personal appearance does not concern me. So, In chapter 2, we get a really nice long look at Lewis's own biases and how the assumptions that he makes based on those biases shape his views and his arguments in favor of those views. Uh, for instance, he says that the solar system seems odd because we would naturally expect the sizes or the relative distances of planets to match or to follow some regular pattern. But this seems like something that C.S. Lewis just made up himself. There's really no reason why we should have expected to see anything like what Lewis describes when talking about what we would expect to find when we looked at the solar system. And at the risk of citing my own bias uh, to counter Lewis's bias, uh, when I was a child, and I studied astronomy extensively as a child, 
And when I first learned about the planets and the, 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 the structure and the function of the solar system, I never found it odd at all that the planets were different sizes or different distances from the sun and from each other, or that they had different numbers of moons or things like this. Uh, it, it, just, it just struck me as, okay, well, that's just the way things are. That's really interesting. And it seems to me like uh, that sort of objection that Lewis poses to the solar system would be like saying that uh, a tree seems odd to you because it has an irregular number of branches or, or the branches are different sizes or they're arranged in seemingly random spots in different locations going up the trunk. It just seems like an odd objection to make. There's really no reason why you would assume that a tree would be any different than it is or that the solar system would be any different than it is. And uh, we've known for hundreds of years and certainly we knew during Lewis's lifetime that uh, the planets were not sized or distributed randomly among the solar system. That in fact, the sizes and the distances of the planets and their motions around the sun and relative to each other are governed by some very specific rules that allow us to know and to predict with great accuracy a very great deal of information about the planets and the other objects in our solar system. Just because they're not the really kind of superficial and simplistic rules that Lewis expects, or seems to expect, uh, doesn't mean that they're not there. The, the planets in the solar system are definitely governed by very specific, very discoverable and comprehensible rules. But that's just the warm-up for Lewis's biases. Uh, the biggest display of his, his own cognitive bias comes in his handling of dualism. Uh, in fact, his handling of dualism depends on these, on his biased assumptions about it. First, uh, let me read this quote to you. He says that dualism requires that we have one God that is truly good and one God that is truly bad. Quote, but the moment you say that, you are putting into the universe a third thing in addition to the two powers, some law or standard or rule of good which one of the powers conforms to and the other fails to conform to. But since the two powers are judged by this standard, then this standard, or the being who made this standard, is farther back and higher up than either of them, and he will be the real God. Now, notice how smoothly he slides in that quote, in just the space of a few words, from assuming a standard of good to assuming a being that created that standard to God with a capitalized pronoun and everything, the God that he specifically believes in. Uh, he's really good at this. He's really strong with his use of rhetoric. He, 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 he didn't get it by me, though. Uh, and then after that, he goes into this business about how badness can't exist on its own without good. You can't be bad for badness sake. Uh, and he says that you can be good for goodness sake, but you can't be wicked for wickedness sake. Uh, there's really no reason to make this assumption. This is another baseless assumption. The only way you can say that there's no such thing as bad for badness's sake is if you first establish, again, by an assumption, that good is superior to rather than equal to and opposite of evil, um, and then you also establish that certain things are good rather than morally neutral. Once you've got all that on your side to begin with, then you can make Lewis's argument that there's no such thing as, as bad for badness as sake. Because um, in order to deny badness that equal status with goodness, uh, you have to define certain things as inherently good, and we'll see how Lewis does that in a second here. And here's a quote from Lewis to illustrate what I'm talking about. Uh, he's just been talking about the bad god of dualism, and he says of the bad god of dualism, quote, To be bad, he must exist and have intelligence and will. But existence, intelligence, and will are in themselves good. Therefore, he must be getting them from the good power. Even to be bad, he must borrow or steal from his opponent. Now, you see what he does there? He, he, he goes ahead and defines existence and intelligence and will as good. So that by definition, in order for the bad god to be bad, he has to use these good traits, which establishes him as subordinate and dependent upon good, even when he's being bad. Bad is just good gone wrong. It perfectly fits into Lewis's uh, viewpoint 
But the problem is, you have to make a lot of unwarranted assumptions to get there to start with. Because who says that existence and intelligence and will are inherently good? What reason do we have for starting there, for saying that they're good? Why can't they just be morally neutral? In fact, doesn't it make much more sense for them to be neither good nor evil? So basic are they to our existence? Um, and it's not as if Lewis is uncomfortable with the idea of moral neutrality, as a lot of Christians are. Um, because in the previous section, remember, we see him describing uh, human instincts as neither good nor bad. So if he's willing to accept that, say, our, our sexual drives or our feelings of love toward one another or patriotism, loyalty, etc., if he's willing to say that these things are morally neutral, neither good nor bad, how is it then that he assumes that these even more basic and fundamental and universal traits like existence and intelligence and will are inherently good rather than morally neutral. Because if our instincts are neither good nor bad, but only how and when we choose to pursue them, how can we not say the same thing about our intelligence or our will? Doesn't it follow if we're going to say that instincts are morally neutral? That it's how we use our intelligence? It's how we direct our will? It's what we do with our existence that makes something good or bad? Chapter 3, The Shocking Alternative. Lewis begins this chapter by asking whether or not the state of the world as enemy-occupied territory, as he describes it, is in accordance with the will of God, and if it is in accordance with the will of God, as Lewis says it is, then what does this tell us about God? Well, to explain why God allows evil to exist in his world, Lewis makes the free will argument. Here's another popular Christian argument that we find in Lewis the free will argument. Uh, basically, God created beings with free will, knowing full well that some of us would misuse our freedom, would use our freedom to commit evil, but he figured it was worth the risk because he knew that without free will, then true love and true happiness would not be possible. Uh, this is also, Lewis supposes, how the devil, or the dark power, as he calls it in his uh, Narnia writer guys, I suppose, uh, went wrong. He misused his free will. He rebelled against God. Uh, the sin of Satan, Lewis guesses, uh, and he says he guesses because no human can give a certain answer to this question. Uh, the sin of Satan was that he put himself first. He put himself before God. He wanted to be the center of his life, not God. And worse yet, he taught this sin to Adam and Eve, who Lewis <laughs> describes as, quote, our remote ancestors a little embarrassing, uh, giving humanity the idea that happiness apart from God was possible, which Lewis calls hopeless, uh, and Lewis blames pretty much every bad thing that's ever happened to humans as a whole uh, on this hopeless attempt at living life apart from God. It's to this that we can chalk up things like poverty and war and, like I say, pretty much every other bad thing people have ever done. Lewis says that God created humans as engines designed to run on himself. He really comes up with these creative, if somewhat silly, metaphors very well. Uh, the problem is that humans have tried to run their engines without the right fuel. We, we are God-fueled engines, you see, and we're trying to run ourselves on different fuel than we are designed to run on. And hence, because of that, all of our great civilizations, no matter how monumental their achievements, no matter how long they have lasted, eventually they are all doomed to fail and to fall, according to Lewis, because of, we, we keep using the, the, the wrong gas in our engines. What does God do about this? He sees all this destruction happening, he sees all these civilizations rising and falling, all this suffering. What does God do about it? Well, according to Lewis, he gives us our sense of right and wrong, our conscience. Throughout our history, he plants dreams of gods dying and returning to life in the myths of other religions, and this is essentially his true myth theory, which I'll talk about a little bit in a second. And then he also selects a specific group of people, the Jews, as his chosen people to whom he reveals himself and attempts to teach about his nature and his expectations. And then, at the end of all that, Jesus shows up, claiming to be God incarnate, claiming the power to forgive sins, claiming that he would return one day to judge the world. And Lewis calls these claims by Jesus, when properly understood, 
uh, the most shocking thing that has ever been uttered by human lips. More shocking than, and the Oscar goes to Marissa Tomei? I'm not sure about that. Uh, Lewis then talks about Jesus' claim to be able to forgive sins. And he says that if anyone other than God made this claim, if, if Jesus was not truly God, and he claimed the ability to forgive any and all sins committed by everyone everywhere, it would be a preposterous claim. And it only makes sense if he is the God who made the rules that are being broken in the act of sinning in the first place. And then the chapter closes with uh, the famous Lewis Trilemma, and I was actually kind of shocked to see it come out so early. I've never read the book before, so I wasn't sure where it would be, but it's such a legendary passage and, and, and used so often by Christian apologists that I was a little surprised uh, <laughs> to see it um, this early in uh, chapter three of book two of, of Mere Christianity. But here is uh, the famous Lewis Trilemma, quote, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claims to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So let's back up a bit to the uh, beginning of uh, chapter 3, because he makes a free will argument. And uh, the free will argument to me seems like a nice way for Christians to let God off the hook and to blame themselves for our problems, uh, which fits nicely, actually, since I have found uh, self-loathing to be a very large part of Christianity wherever I've encountered it. Um, it's always god's grace and god's love that is saving us because we don't deserve to be saved we've broken the rules we've sinned in the eyes of god god can barely stand to be in the same room with us and he has every right to cast us all into hell uh, for breaking his rules and rejecting him but he wants to save us because he's just that good uh, that's a very deeply felt deeply held part of christianity um, and it's difficult to imagine a more abject and pernicious form of self-hatred. Uh, to say that we are not only responsible for our own troubles in a literal sense, but in a grander, universal, spiritual sense. That this is all our fault as a species because we have sinned and we have separated ourselves from God. And because of that, we are worthless. But God still loves us, even though we don't deserve it. It's all God. It's not that we deserve love. It's that God loves us and he's willing to reach down and save us. You can't imagine a more pitiful self-image than what Christianity imposes upon humanity. It's really, really offensive. And also, not only that, but the free will argument uh, completely ignores the massive amounts of suffering and destruction caused, inflicted upon humanity by natural disasters. Although, Lewis does apply the free will argument to explain the fall of Satan, uh, as well as the fall of man. So maybe we're meant to believe that earthquakes and hurricanes and such are Satan's fault? I'm not really sure. Now, uh, Lewis also brings up what later became known as his true myth theory, and I made an entire video about that, actually. Uh, so I won't say a whole lot about it here. All I will say is that it increases my respect for Lewis, the fact that he would even come up with this idea, even though I think that the theory is horseshit and that it's just much simpler, much makes much more sense to believe that the reason why there are mythical elements in the Jesus story is because it's mythical. Um, the fact that Lewis would formulate and make this argument uh, means that he is at least acknowledging that these mythic universals are present in the Jesus story, and he is attempting to reconcile his Christianity with this fact. And the, the, the mere fact that he even does it, regardless of whether I respect the argument or not, puts him head and shoulders above pretty much all modern Christian apologists who usually deal with the mythical seeming elements of the Jesus story by just pretending that they aren't there 
and hoping that nobody brings them up. Lewis at least attempts to, ex to acknowledge and to explain them, and for that he gets points with me. Lewis also says in this chapter that it would be preposterous for anyone other than God to claim the right to absolve people of all their sins. Well, I say that it's preposterous for God to make that claim. Um, even if I grant you the existence of a God who defines our moral laws, and I accept that, say, stealing is a violation of those laws, that still doesn't give God the right to forgive me for stealing something from someone else on behalf of the person that I stole it from, which is the right that Jesus claims. I mean, such a God could say, hey, uh, you know, I know that you broke my rule, but don't worry, it's all good, I forgive you. He could say that, but he's not really the wronged party. I didn't steal from him. I may have broken his rule, but I didn't steal from him. I stole from this other person over there. That's the person that needs to forgive me. God has no right to forgive me for taking something from this person. Because I didn't take it from him, I took it from them. God has nothing to do with it. Even if, he, even if he did say, hey, don't steal, I still didn't do any wrong to him, or at least I did a lesser wrong to him than I did to the person I actually stole from. And the fact that God is apparently insisting that he is the truly, the ultimately wronged party, and not the person who was actually the victim of the crime. The fact that God would even assert that, would even try to, to, to convince us that that was true, just makes God seem like a huge dick, which actually is in character, given what we learn about God from reading the Bible. Finally, for this chapter, we have the famous Lewis trilemma. Uh, we can dispose of this very easily, actually. For, for as, as large as it looms over Christian apologetics, the Lewis trilemma is actually one of the weaker bits that Lewis has come up with so far in this book. First, uh, the issue for Lewis is that he says we should not accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but not as God. Well, that's easy enough. I don't accept Jesus as a great moral teacher. Done. I'm out. See? It's good. I'm, I'm, I'm done at this point. But uh, let's just assume for the sake of argument that uh, Jesus was a great moral teacher. Is it really impossible for us to believe that Jesus was a great moral teacher and also to reject his claims to be God? Uh, is it really true that he must be either God or a liar or a lunatic? Obviously my answer to these questions is no. And getting there again is relatively easy. Um, we just have to subject this Jesus that we find in the New Testament to a critical reading. We actually know for certain almost nothing about Jesus. The reason for that is the only source we have for the life of Jesus is the New Testament. And as I discussed in the series about the case for Christ, uh, that is not a reliable source for historical facts about Jesus. Uh, we know, for instance, even Christians are forced to admit that the Gospels that we have today are filled with passages that were added much later by early Christians who wanted intentionally to shape the portrayal of Jesus to suit their own purposes. So if someone, I don't know who, let's say Thomas Jefferson, uh, wanted to distill the Gospels down to only the things which reasonably could have happened or which a sane and moral Jesus could have said, uh, that seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to do. So that's another way of disposing of uh, Lewis's trilemma. And yet, beyond those two ways, it's also possible uh, to reject the trilemma by believing that the Jesus of the Gospels is a good moral teacher, but he never actually existed. Therefore, his claims about being the Son of God are irrelevant, because no one in reality ever made those claims. Uh, he was a legend, or at least he was so embellished by legend that uh, the man we read about in the New Testament bears little resemblance to the actual historical man that was the basis for that New Testament figure. You know, thinking about Lewis's trilemma, it occurs to me, now that I've actually read it in context in the rest of the book, uh, Lewis rejects atheism, so he says, for being too simplistic. But as we can see already, uh, he is rather fond himself of reductive and simplistic arguments. We come now to chapter 4, The Perfect Penitent. Lewis finds it obvious himself that Jesus was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, therefore he must accept that he was and is God as he claimed to be, regardless of how C.S. Lewis himself might feel about that. Lewis then cautions us not to confuse theories of how 
salvation through Christ works with the fact that salvation through Christ has put us right again with God. And he compares explaining how Christian salvation works to explaining an atom to a scientific layman. Uh, you're given a model which allows you to visualize what is going on, what you're being uh, told about, but you're also cautioned that the model has been simplified for you to allow your understanding and that it doesn't represent the reality entirely accurately. The thing itself, Lewis says, cannot be pictured. And he says, quote, We know that Christ was killed for us, that his death has washed out our sins, and that by dying he disabled death itself. That is the formula. That is Christianity. That is what has to be believed. So having established that caveat, Lewis then goes on to describe the crucifixion uh, and how it works as he understands it. And he describes the crucifixion and Christian atonement uh, not so much as Jesus taking our punishment, which he agrees doesn't make much sense, since uh, if God was willing to forgive us, he might as well just have done so, uh, but rather as Jesus paying our debt. And I, I again, I can see how incredibly influential this work is because I can't count how many times Christians have said that exact same thing to me. It's not that Jesus was being punished for us. It's more like he was paying our debt, especially when I bring up my moral objections to Christianity. They say, how can you have a problem with someone else paying your debt? So it's a really effective way of looking at it if you're a Christian. So Jesus pays our debt, and in accepting Jesus' payment of our debt, we are, in effect, laying down our arms and leaving the rebel army uh, in order to rejoin God. That's how Lewis puts it. He's kind of mixing his metaphors there. But nonetheless, that's how he puts it. And then he describes how difficult it is for most people to willingly and totally submit themselves to God, uh, to get rid of all that selfishness that has separated us from God in the first place. Uh, he says it's very difficult, but it's possible if God helps us which uh, God does by putting a little bit of himself into us, allowing us to think, allowing us to feel the way he needs us to feel. And Lewis likens this to um, a parent teaching a child to write by allowing the child to follow the parent's hand as he writes uh, to learn how to form the letters. And one of the reasons why God became incarnated as a man uh, in the person of Jesus, according to this argument by Lewis, is in order that he could understand these parts of human experience that he had no knowledge of. Being, being perfect and, and omnipotent and eternal, God knew nothing about suffering or death, so he, he suffered and died in the person of Jesus so that he would understand these things, and now he does understand them and he's able to help us deal with these things ourselves. Lewis mentions and dismisses the complaint that Jesus could not have actually suffered and died as humans do because he was really God the whole time. And God never really suffers and, and never really dies. Lewis counters this by claiming that what he calls the perfect suffering and the perfect death uh, on the cross by Jesus, uh, these things were necessary in order to reconcile all men with God. And they were only possible because Jesus was God. If he had not been God and had not been perfect, he would have fucked it up somehow, according to Lewis. And the fact that he was God allowed him to attain uh, perfection of suffering and perfection of death. It's that advantage that comes with being God that allows God to be of use to us. It's the only reason that Christianity is allowed to exist. Otherwise, God, Jesus, would not have been able to do those things. So, let's analyze a bit. Uh, Lewis compares the attempts to understand and explain how Christian salvation works to a scientist attempting to explain the structure of an atom to a layperson. And that is a very clever analogy, I think. And I also appreciate his statement that however one understands the how of salvation is less important than the fact of salvation itself. It's the how that is less important and it's the that that is really what matters. And that's very ecumenical. Uh, Lewis has been, he has sounded sort of a pluralistic ecumenical note in this chapter, and I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate that attitude. Uh, the problem with all of that, 
and with everything else that Lewis discusses in this chapter, from perceiving the crucifixion as the payment of a debt rather than the taking of a punishment, accepting forgiveness and submitting to God with God himself, helping us to overcome our selfishness and self-centeredness, uh, how God's experience as a human allowed him to understand and to help us with these sufferings, all of that uh, can be brought crashing to the floor with a single question. And it's the question that you should always ask anybody whenever they tell you stuff about God. And the question is this, how do you know this? Because C.S. Lewis has crafted a really kind of a lovely sounding theology here. I mean, I would still reject it myself because no matter how pretty he makes it sound, I still find the Christian concept of salvation to be fundamentally immoral. I find it to be morally repugnant, actually. Uh, because whether we were due a punishment or owed God a debt, uh, it was within God's power to simply forgive us without executing an innocent person in a horrific and bloody fashion, and then uh, compounding that crime by forcing all of us to choose between affirming that this horrible execution had paid our debt or being tormented forever in hell. I, I would never worship, respect, love, whatever, any god that did that and then forced that choice on people. It, it's, it's morally reprehensible. And for that reason, even if I believed it were true, I could never be a Christian. Um, but even if you didn't feel that way about it and you read Lewis's explanation of Christian salvation and it sounded like a good deal to you, um, it's all empty rhetoric if it's not describing a real thing. And there is not a single reason to assume that it's talking about a real thing. Lewis is standing atop the assumption that the New Testament is true and reliable. He never questions the authenticity of the New Testament for a moment in this book. He, he assumes that the Gospels are reliable, and he stands upon that assumption. Uh, that's how he gets to the Lord Lunatic or Liar Trilemma. That's how he gets to the How Salvation Works Isn't As Important As That It Works statement. That's how he arrives at every place he goes in this presentation of mere Christianity. It all starts with that assumption that we must rely on the Bible, on the New Testament. And there is no rational or factual basis for making that assumption. And finally, chapter 5, the practical conclusion. Lewis compares the life Christians believe is coming to them after this life, and also their, their life in Christ f after their conversion, uh, which he consists of uh, attaining perfect happiness, and after we die we have perfect bodies and a perfect perfectly happy life in heaven with God, thanks to the perfect surrender and perfect humiliation of our perfect God. Um, Lewis describes this, or he likens it, to the next step in our biological evolution, of whatever comes after man on the evolutionary timeline if we project it forward into the future. Uh, Lewis says, quote, In Christ a new kind of man appeared, and the new kind of life which began in him is to be put into us. Lewis describes three things which bring this new Christ life to us. Uh, those three things are baptism, belief, and communion. Now he says that these three things are not the only things, uh, nor is he willing to say that any one is more important than the other, again maintaining that ecumenical spirit. Uh, but he just will say that all three of these things are present and are conducting us into the new Christ life. Lewis admits that he cannot see why these three things should be the things that lead us into the new Christ life, but he says, quote, We have to take reality as it comes to us. There is no good jabbering about what it ought to be like or what we should have expected it to be like. So he can't tell us why things are like this, but he can tell us why he believes they are like this. Uh, and he believes it because Jesus tells us that it is so, and he, he believes it on the authority of Jesus. He finds Jesus to be trustworthy, therefore he trusts Jesus when Jesus says that there is new life in him. Lewis then stresses the importance of trying to emulate Christ, and he draws a distinction between Christians and other people trying to be good. Christians, he says, are not good because they wish to please God or because they wish to please other people. Rather, Christians are good because God is making them good through his love. Uh, and when Christians talk about living in Christ, what they mean by that is that Christ is actually operating 
in the world through their actions, and that the whole of Christianity, the, the, the sum of all Christians in the world, actually comprise an organism through which Christ acts on the world. And then Lewis closes the chapter and, and this book uh, by stressing that a Christian need not feel bad that this new Christ life that they will have is only open to those who have heard of and accepted Christ because, Lewis says, Lewis says, quote, But the truth is God has not told us what his arrangements about the other people are. We do know that no man can be saved except through Christ. We do not know that only those who know him can be saved through him. You get that? Um, so, in the meantime, Christians believe that God has chosen to reveal himself through Christ rather than invading in force, as it were, uh, and revealing himself to everyone at once because he wants to give people the chance of joining his side freely before he invades and the ultimate result becomes a foregone conclusion. And to finish the chapter, Lewis says, quote, Now, today, this moment is our chance to choose the right side. God is holding back to give us that chance. It will not last forever. We must take it or leave it. How do you know? How do you know? How do you know? Again, I'm impressed with how ecumenical Lewis is. I, I like that he takes care not to push any particular brand of Christianity, not to elevate one of the three rites he mentions above any of the others. Um, he does mention that he is of the Church of England, but he doesn't try to promote Church of England Anglican theology above Catholic theology or any other form of Christianity. Um, and at the end there, he even seems to open the door a crack for universalism to the doctrine that everyone will be eventually reconciled to God and there is ultimately going to be no such place as, as hell in reality. Uh, maybe God has a plan to reconcile those people who have never heard of Christ or who have been unable to believe in him with himself. Uh, although, maybe not, because Lewis did also remember back in the first chapter of Book 2, uh, he did disparage believing in heaven without believing in hell. Uh, Christianity and water, remember he called it. Um, and also he does say that salvation is only possible through Christ, which would leave out those of us who have heard of and rejected Christ. Uh, I know who Christians are talking about when they mention Jesus. I just don't believe that he was who they say he was. And more than that, if I did believe he was who they say he was, I still wouldn't be a Christian, so I'm fucked every which way. It's a good thing, though, that I have no reason to believe that any of it is true. But in that spirit, I think that Lewis's quote from this last chapter uh, that I read earlier seems like an appropriate note to close on, although not in the way Lewis would have hoped, I'm sure. I'll read it to you again. It says, quote, We have to take reality as it comes to us. There is no good jabbering about what it ought to be like or what we should have expected it to be like. That's a lesson that many Christians, including, unfortunately, it seems, C.S. Lewis, uh, had a great have a great deal of, of trouble accepting. So that is book two of Mere Christianity. Next time I will be doing the first half of book three. Book three and book four, remember, are the longer ones. Uh, they each have 12 chapters as opposed to five. So uh, next video is chapters one through six of book three, which is titled Christian Behavior. So be here for that. Uh, thank you all so much for watching as always, and I'll see you next time.